All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to my talk titled Automated Triage Collection at Scale in AWS. I'm Ryan Tick and I'm your presenter today. And real quick before we get started, I just wanted to say a huge shout out to all of the B-Sides DFW organizers. You know, I can only imagine how difficult it is to plan a conference in general, uh, but I imagine it's that much more difficult during a global pandemic. Um, so everything behind the scenes that they're doing to make sure that this conference runs seamlessly, um, really a huge shout out to them. Um, but with that, you know, I'm super excited to attend a lot of your talks today, uh, especially in this afternoon. And I'm really excited uh, to share with you some information about the triage collection solution that, that we developed here. So with that, let's go over our agenda. So first we'll talk about the uh, objectives of the solution. So what the solution looks to accomplish and we'll frame those against the problem statement. So some problems that we look to tackle with this solution. Next, we'll talk about the benefits of a triage collection workflow, and we'll compare those against the full disk collection workflow. Uh, we'll deep dive into the solution, right? So for the more technical folks on the, uh, the, this talk today, I think this is what you're really going to enjoy. So we'll step through the different lambdas and different parts of the step function and, and talk about some key services that we use. And then we'll end with what I like to call pro tips. So these are basically you know, my lessons learned uh, over you know, the struggles in designing this solution and getting it to where it's at today. And I'll give you some further learning resources at the end. So um, these touch on a variety of different um, you know, defer topics in AWS that I find valuable and I'm biased because I've presented a few of these before, but I think they are helpful to supplement this talk as well. Um, so with that, so before we get started, uh, let me tell you a bit more about myself. So I'm a manager at KPMG based out of the Dallas office here. Um, I specialize in traditional incident response, and I am one of our more technical resources in AWS. So within AWS, I focus on um, security engineering and architecture, um, specifically around digital forensics and incident response. So I try to make you know, the incident responders job that much more easy uh, in AWS by automating a lot of the, uh, the tasks here. Uh, I do have quite a few credentials next to my name. So uh, IC squared, SANS, and uh, AWS have all given me some credentials. Uh, recently, I passed my solutions architect professional. Uh, that was no joke. I'm super proud to have that one. I'm working towards the networking specialty now. I've heard that's even more difficult than the SA Pro. Um, so I definitely have my work cut out for me there. Um, in a past life, I was a senior cloud security engineer and architect for Goldman Sachs. That was really interesting. So I worked on our Marcus team. And if you're not familiar with Marcus, they are the team that worked jointly with Apple to develop the Apple credit card. And then uh, kind of halfway through my career with Goldman, I shifted into a more firm-wide capacity. So I was responsible for security orchestration and automated response. Uh, but at the time, we had nearly 3,000 AWS accounts. So that was operating at a, at a planetary scale there too. So that was really interesting. Um, I've presented at a lot of different conferences, uh, a couple that I'm really proud of, right? Obviously all I presented B-Sides before, so super excited. This one in particular, uh, given that I live in Dallas, super excited to you know, help out the community a little bit. I've also presented at AWS reInvent last year. And then I partnered with uh, AWS to give a Q3 tech talk as well. So that was really interesting. Uh, and lastly, if we got any Fighting Irish on the call, I am a University of Notre Dame grad, uh, so go Irish, and I encourage you know, all of you, whether or not you went to the University of Notre Dame, uh, connect with me after the talk and, and let's chat. So with that, um, let's talk through some of the objectives of the solution when it was in its early design stages. Uh, so the first one may seem pretty obvious, given that this is a triage collection uh, workflow. But we need to design an automated workflow to allow for the triage collection of EC2 instances at scale. So it needed to uh, you know, tailor to Windows, Linux, and Mac instances at scale, since you can spin up all three of those uh, on EC2 instances. And it needed to work in a same account, cross account, and cross region scenario. Uh, what I mean by that, so for same account, uh, depending on where the solution is deployed, let's say I deploy a solution in solution A, it needs to be able to uh, you know, perform a triage collection against an instance in solution A. Uh, with cross account, if I deploy a solution in uh, an account A, it needs to be able to collect an instance in account B, right? So cross account. And lastly, with a cross region scenario, so let's say this solution is deployed in US East 1, it also needs to be able to collect an instance in US East 2, right? So cross region. So that is the first objective, right? Basically get the triage collection to work at all these different uh, scenarios. Uh, the second one, right, so this is interesting, so not EC, all uh, EC2 instances that I'm going to want to run a triage collection package uh, against, 
um, will have the necessary permissions in AWS that they need, right? So for example, if I have an EC2 instance um, and I want to perform a triage collection on it, well, I need to figure out how to get my triage collection of scripts on that instance. Now for our solution, we're storing those scripts in an S3 bucket. So who's to say that that target EC2 instances has, target EC2 instance has access to that triage collection script bucket. And on the flip side, um, it needs to be able to write the um, output somewhere. So our solution writes the output of a triage collection script as a zip file, and then it uploads uh, that file to an evidence S3 bucket. Now, again, who's to say that the target EC2 instance has access to write to that evidence bucket? That'd be a lot of overhead if I needed every single instance in my environment to be able to read from one bucket and write to another bucket, be an instance profile. Um, you know, that was an objective. And lastly, you know, keeping the principle of least privilege in mind, uh, following best practices uh, when it comes to you know, highly available solution, um, and then leveraging an external ID or an EID when performing cross account actions. Um, so these were the three objectives when we were in the early design stages of the solution. Before I deep dive into the solution, let's talk about some of the problems that this solution looked to tackle. So the first year, FDC, full disk collections. So full disk collections are expensive and timely. So not only are they expensive in terms of, you know, uh, workforce hours required to perform a, a full disk collection, uh, they're very resource expensive too, right? You're getting an abundance of data. You need to store that data somewhere. And, and then they're also very costly, right? So they cost money to store all that data and perform this collection. Uh, and lastly, you know, they're not quick. Um, especially if you're doing this in AWS, what you generally do is you describe an instance, you look at all the volumes attached to that instance, and then you create snapshots out of each volume, right? That process can take time. Maybe you encrypt those snapshots, right? So again, another stage where that will take time. And then you could, you know, attach those snapshots to a collector EC2 instance, and finally run a tool like DD and create a raw, you know, output of each volume. So, you know, challenging, uh, timely, uh, and it, when answers are needed quickly during an investigation, uh, a full disk collection may not be your first choice, right? You may tend towards a triage collection solution like this workflow looks to accomplish. The second point here, um, so I've seen a lot of clients leverage existing workflows when they move to the cloud. And by that, I mean, you know, a specific client may have a solution that they like to perform triage collections against on-prem instances, and they're able to port that over to the cloud. Now, nothing wrong with that at all. Let's be clear. If it works, it works. Um, and if you're happy with the metrics and the time to collect, uh, who am I to tell you that there's a better option out there? Um, but what I do think some of those solutions miss out on is a lot of the cloud-native capabilities that you can get by leveraging cloud-native uh, services within AWS. Um, we'll talk about, you know, this... Uh, a triage collection workflow and how it leverages some cloud native services, namely, you know, SSM systems manager. Uh, we'll get to that a little further on. And lastly, right, so there's this idea of rapidly changing cloud environment. So again, I had alluded to earlier when I worked at, at Goldman Sachs, uh, we had almost 3000 AWS accounts. So let's say, you know, each one of these little people down here represent an account, right? Companies tend not to only have one AWS account. They have many accounts. Um, and your solution needs to be flexible enough to allow for triage collections to happen in each one of those accounts. Uh, well, not only that, but these environments are changing rapidly. So if you look at the bottom of the screen now, let's say I just onboarded a bunch of AWS accounts. Maybe I acquired a new business, and now all of a sudden, I have these new accounts as part of my environment. Not only that, but let's say each developer at my company gets their own AWS account as a sandbox, right? Uh, and I had a few developers leave. Well, now we have a couple of accounts that are off board. They disappeared. And not only that, right? But, you know, again, since these environments are changing so much, if we're kind of monitoring our compliance or any sort of configuration drift, let's say accounts tend to be, you know, out of compliance with our standards that we've set forth. So this solution needs to be flexible enough to accept new accounts, to you know uh, any accounts that are offboarded, um, to alert early if we don't think the solution will work, maybe because an account is out of compliance. So it needs to be a very flexible solution. With that, so let's talk about some benefits of a triage collection workflow. Uh, these are just benefits in general. Uh, we can compare these to a full disk collection or FD, FDC uh, workflow. 
Um, but number one is, you know, triage collections work so well because they're collecting a lot less data. Uh, and by doing so, the collection is that much quick, uh, quicker, right? So you can get anybody answers, hopefully, uh, that much faster since you're able to pull back the data and start analysis that much quicker as compared to a full disk uh, collection. The second uh, you know, benefit here is since we've automated everything and it's all written this code, um, the process itself to perform the triage collection workflow is going to be very standardized, right? So these same commands are going to run against an EC2 instance. It's going to be auditable. So wherever possible, we've, enab we've enabled logging. We have custom logs and everything's obviously written to CloudTrail as well. And then our cloud native approach, um, since we're using all cloud native technology here, it um, lends itself to a reduced cost, a quicker response time too, and quicker collection time, uh, and a lot of other benefits there as well. And now for those of you out there who are just willing to die on the hill that you need a full disk collection, I, I don't blame you. Uh, having worked in the finance sector, right, it's very rigid there in certain uh, requirements, right? So this can be done in parallel with a full disk collection. Uh, so just because you're doing a triage collection doesn't mean you, you uh, can't do a full disk collection, right? So you can do both. Uh, and really gain the benefits of both. And I'll talk about some limitations of this solution at the end, uh, but namely one of, one of the prereqs of this triage collection solution is that you need to have an SSM agent present on the target EC2 instance where you want to perform that triage collection solution. Um, now with a full disk collection, if you leverage cloud native services, um, you don't need to have any agent present. So there's some benefits there to a full disk collection, don't let me mislead you. And I'll talk to those at the end, provide some great additional resources at the end, I think too. Now with that, let's get to the uh, everything we've all been waiting for here, uh, the solution deep dive. So, and you've heard me talk about SSM a few times, uh, let's clarify. So AWS Systems Manager or SSM is at the absolute heart of our solution, of our triage collection workflow. Um, I've taken this first bullet here. Um, this is basically the definition of SSM uh, per Amazon. So I've made sure to link um, you know, where I took this from. But SSM allows for the automation, of common and repetitive IT operations and management tasks. So with that, you can execute commands um, or scripts as part of a response action on EC2 instances, right? And that's how we're going to be leveraging it for um, you know, our triage collection. So I, with SSM, I can pipe certain commands to an instance to run on that instance, um, and I can check the status of those commands, right? So SSM, again, is going to be responsible for all of the uh, triage collection commands that we're running. Um, now, as I alluded to earlier with this third bullet here, Systems Manager requires an agent, an SSM agent to be present on the target EC2 instance or instances that you want to collect from. Not only that, but those target EC2 instances need to allow the communication with the SSM service to take place. And when I say allow, I mean at the account level, right? So just because an EC2 instance has the SSM agent installed, on it doesn't necessarily mean that instance has the necessary permissions to communicate with SSM. Um, so that's kind of a second requirement here, um, but I'll talk about why it's not a requirement in our solution. So again, really the main prerequisite to this solution is that the target EC2 instance needs to have the SSM agent or the systems manager agent installed. And, and you may look at me and you may be like, Ryan, that's asking a lot. And, and I agree, uh, it's not realistic for a company to have 100% coverage um, for all EC2 instances to have the SSM agent present on them. But kind of our saving grace here is that um, with each operating system I've outlined here, um, the majority of AMIs corresponding to those operating systems actually have the systems manager agent pre-installed. You may just not know it. Um, if you haven't given your instance the appropriate permissions to communicate with SSM, that's why it's not showing up. Now for Windows, for example, right, any AMI that you use, uh, that Amazon manages, right, any AMI um, that was created post November 2016, it's going to have the systems manager agent already pre-installed. And for the sake of this talk, 2016, almost five years ago, I hope we don't have too many EC2 instances created out of AMIs that are five years old. Um, but, you know, Windows Server 2008 to 2012, 2016, 2019, these will all have the systems manager agent installed on them. Uh, same with Linux, you know, most Linux flavors um, will have the SM agent installed here too. I've listed a bunch of different um, OSs here, uh, but namely, you know, Amazon Linux 2, uh, Ubuntu, they're gonna have it installed by default, which is really nice. Uh, and lastly, you may not know this, but um, EC2 instances now support Mac OS, which is a really cool uh, feature. Uh, now, they tend to be expensive if I'm not wrong. I think they're based off bare metal instance type. So, you know, 
uh, watch the cost there. But the SSM agent is pre-installed by default on all of the current Mac OS AMIs that uh, AWS offers. Uh, so Catalina, Mojave, and Big Sur. So you can see, while it's a prerequisite to have the SSM agent installed, it does come standard, I would argue, on most AMIs and OSs that you're going to use in your environment. Now, I wanted to introduce Systems Manager and talk about the agent before I even got into really what the solution does, because it is central to our solution. But before I actually get into walking through exactly what our solution does, I wanted to set the scene. So let's say, you know, I log in Monday morning, 8 a.m. to my workstation, and I'm presented with this guard duty finding. Unauthorized access uh, to an EC2 instance, and it's being used as a Tor relay node. Um, for the sake of this, you don't necessarily need to know much about Tor relay nodes or Tor in general, um, but let's just say you got not one alert, but let's say you got a bunch of different alerts here. And let's also you know, imagine that each alert corresponded to a different, a different EC2 instance in your environment. Maybe they're in different accounts, different regions, um, et cetera. But you know, my next step here is I start to do an investigation. Maybe I'd want to perform a triage collection uh, against each one of these EC2 instances. It could be a good next step. Um, but with that, you know, the manual process for having to do that, I need to ensure that I have access to each account, uh, you know, where these instances, where each instance lives. I need to make sure I have the appropriate permissions to perform a triage collection. Not only that, but I have to figure out how to get, you know, hands-on keyboard to these EC2 instances to perform a triage collection. So, you know, if it's with an SSH key or an RDP key, um, you know, how do I actually get onto the instance? Uh, does that instance have the necessary permissions where I can go ahead and download the triage collection script or where I can go ahead and you know, upload my evidence package to an S3 evidence bucket. A lot of considerations here, and that's only the technical aspect of it. We're not even accounting for human error, right? Let's say I think there's seven alerts here. Uh, let's say you know, um, whatever malware was in the environment here, let's say it spread to 15, 20, 30 hosts. Uh, now all of a sudden I have to do my standardized practice um, for the triage collection on each one of these instances. And that can be a challenge. It could lend to long, uh, long hours. It's a serial approach, right? I can only do one instance at a time. Maybe I'm getting tired towards the end. I'm starting to make mistakes. So this is where our automated triage collection workflow uh, really starts to shine. And with that, here's a very basic diagram, high level diagram of the workflow. Um, so I'm basically going to walk you through the scenario um, framing that we have this guard duty finding like we just saw. So essentially in a monitored account, right, guard duty looks at a variety of sources, DNS, BBC flow, and uh, CloudTrail. And using those evidence sources, it's able to use uh, AI and machine learning to present findings to someone. So, you know, let's say it analyzed that, it presented us with that finding. Now, in this demonstration, uh, guard duty is feeding into Security Hub from a member account, and then we have that... Uh, member central replication, where all of my findings from each member account will be replicated into a central account, right? So in my security account, where I'm deploying this triage collection workflow, um, I can see all of the security of findings for all of my member accounts, right? They just feed in passively. Uh, now, you know, we're on the right side of this diagram now. There's two ways that you can trigger this solution. Uh, so the first is it could be triggered automatically using the Amazon event bridge. Uh, you can have roles set up where this solution will fire for specific findings in Security Hub. So let's say that you know, there's a finding involving an EC2 instance that originated from guard duty. Uh, I can have logic in place where I'll automatically kick off this triage collection workflow. That's why the event bridge is there. The second option is uh, we can actually start at the upper right-hand corner of this diagram as opposed to the upper left. And I can have you know, a team member of mine on the uh, CERT team maybe, they want to go ahead, they have reason to believe that an instance was compromised. Um, they can kick off this step function manually by providing a few things. We'll get into that in a second. Um, but the step function, again, behind the scenes, you'll see this in a second. This is actually what's doing a lot of the, um, you know, hardcore uh, triage collection. Um, but namely, you know, in a cross-account solution, it would assume a cross-account IAM role. Um, it would do a bunch of different things to that target EC2 instance. Uh, and then, you know, it would maybe pull down a triage collection script and then run it on the instance and then upload the output of that triage collection script to our evidence S3 bucket. So with that, let's look at the step function in detail. Again, the upper right hand corner of this diagram, let's look at that in detail because that is what's responsible for doing a lot of the triage collection. 
So here is our step function in all of its glory. Um, you know, you'll notice a few things right off the bat, but before I deep dive, um, let's talk about the inputs to the step function. So if you want to run this step function manually, you can give it a few things. Uh, one, the first thing that's always going to be required is a description of the target instance. And you can do that in a couple of ways. You can either give me the ARN of the target instance that you want to um, collect or perform a triage collection against, uh, Amazon resource name, um, or you can tell me the account, the region, and the instance ID of the um, target instance that you want to perform the triage collection against. Uh, the reason why there's the flexibility there is because the ARN isn't clearly displayed in the console as of now. Um, so you kind of have to construct it your own way. Um, but pretty easy to construct. It follows a, a standard naming convention. So based on your SOPs, what, whatever you do in terms of documenting and collecting, uh, this can take either as input. And the second and last piece of thing that it needs as input uh, is a case ID. Um, so whenever you give me a target instance or a bunch of instances to collect, um, when I output all of that evidence to S3, I'm going to prefix it with a case ID for you so that you can see all of your instances are tied to a specific case uh, during the output process. So with that, let's look at the very top here and check the uh, defined input. So this is the first state of our step function. Um, as I mentioned earlier, right, this workflow can be triggered both automatically via the event bridge or manually, right? So a cert team member can manually kick off this workflow. Um, so because of the manual collection, um, we do do some sanity checks here, right? Just make sure there's no typos, right? Is the account uh, ID that you gave me where the instance lives in, is that a valid length? Is the instance ID valid? Does it appear to be valid? Is the region valid, right? Maybe you gave me USD3, right? Uh, and is the case ID unique? Uh, it's so much easier to check some of those sanity inputs uh, from the start and cancel the workflow than it is later and you're just confused why this, this workflow isn't running. Um, but yeah, so that's the first state. Check to find input, uh, really just sanity check. Um, so the next thing here, and you'll notice these dotted lines uh, in this part of the step function, and that's what's called a map state. So we're all inside a map state here. So all the rest of these functions are gonna be run within a map state. If you're not familiar with the map state, please definitely read up on map states. But essentially what it allows you to do is let's say I gave you multiple EC2 instances as input. Well, each EC2 instance, if I set up my map state correctly, it would get its own vein of the step function. So one EC2 instance would get this exact step function. The other EC2 instance would get a copy of the step function uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, that way, no EC2 instance is kind of slowed down by another EC2 instance. Think of it as like, you know, if I have one EC2 instance and for whatever reason, it's taking a really long time to describe that EC2 instance. Um, without a map state function, you know, that may hold up the other EC2 instances. So with one describe call, if we didn't have a map state function, we'd have to wait until each EC2 instance responds to that describe call until we can move on to the next state in the step function. However, with a, a map state function, again, each uh, instance will get its own vein here. So if the describe uh, target instance step here took uh, was really quick for one instance, that, in, uh, that instance would progress down the step function. And then likewise, if another instance was struggling with this for whatever reason, um, it could wait at that state until it's ready um, and it wouldn't slow down my first instance. But with that, let's talk about describe target instance. Um, so this isn't a necessary part in a metadata collection, um, but or sorry, in a um, triage collection, but it's good to get some metadata around the EC2 instance that, that you're targeting to run the collection against. Maybe you have um, you know, SOPs or um, you know, playbooks that you need to collect certain things about an instance every time you do a collection. And this is where this stage can be tailored. Um, you know, by default, we're getting a lot of the available uh, metadata that's present in the EC2 console or information about the EC2 instance. So I've listed a couple of things here, um, public and private IP addresses, public and private DNS host names, how many volumes are attached to the instance, when the instance was created, so the date and time, and then the OS type with the instance too. But there's a lot of other things. I didn't list them all here. A lot of other things you may be, um, you know, interested in maybe was the instance lost, uh, launched in a public subnet or a private subnet? Let's name the instance profile associated with the instance so you can kind of better understand the blast radius, stuff like that. So again, this is just a step where we're getting all of the metadata uh, about your target instance. 
And in the end, we're going to provide all this information to the incident responder so they don't have to go back at, at the very end and kind of, you know, get this information themselves. Again, this is done for them to save them time and allow them to focus on the important, uh, you know, analysis um, kind of tasks. So after we described the target instance, we talked about the prerequisite to this solution was you need to check the SSM agent status here. So we can do that by a pretty easy photo call. And we can see, um, you know, is the agent or is the EC2 instance reporting into the SSM console or into the SSM service? Now, we're going to assume that by deploying this solution, you followed the prerequisite. So um, if we do, you know, we get the green light and it's reporting into the SSM console, we're down to move down to the uh, left side of this pane here. So the generate pre-signed URL, send SSM command, check SSM command status, and tag evidence in S3. Now, if it is not reporting into the SSM status, um, this isn't necessarily an issue. Now, we'll talk about this on this slide. So if the SSM agent isn't reporting, again, we're assuming that you've done everything correctly and the SSM agent is installed. But even if you've installed the SSM agent, um, kind of like how I talked about earlier, the EC2 instance on which the SSM agent is installed may not have the necessary permissions in IAM to allow the EC2 instance to communicate with the SSM service. So initially when we designed this, this was a second prerequisite that, that we, um, you know, the solution needed. And you can see it's under point two there, right? You could need an existing connection. Um, so you, we need some way that this instance is going to communicate. Uh, before we got more advanced in the solution, uh, we would have an existing connection. We would just say any EC2 instance that you want to be able to perform a triage collection on needs to have the appropriate permissions in SSM. And if it doesn't, what we've seen clients do before is they detect on when you know, new EC2 instances are created, and they will alert on instances that aren't created, um, that are created that don't have the necessary permissions uh, in IAM associated with the instance profile. And then they could even auto-remediate those EC2 instances and basically add an inline portion to allow for that SSM communication to occur. Uh, now that is the more kind of legacy solution. As we got more advanced in the solution, uh, we're leveraging what's called uh, just-in-time access. Um, so that's really cool. So no longer is this a prerequisite to have the existing connection. Basically, just-in-time access says that an, e an instance, for example, or an identity should only be able to do something when it needs to be able to do it, not before, not after, right? So it's temporary access. And in our case here, what we're doing is we're modifying the instance profile of the target EC2 instance on the fly to temporarily allow it to communicate with the SSM service. And then once we're done, then we'll go ahead and remove the ability to communicate with SSM. So that's how we um, get around it here. I'll go back one slide real quick so you can see. Um, but you see the just-in-time uh, credential provisioning on the bottom right there too. So we're basically gonna you know, try to change the instance profile associated with the instance. And then, you know, we're going to assume that the SSM agent is going to be reporting in after a wait. Um, now, if we do a check again and the agent still isn't reporting in, then we will break at this time and this workflow will pause and let you know that, hey, the SSM agent isn't reporting in, please go investigate. Um, otherwise, we're going to assume at this point that we have a target EC2 instance, we described the EC2 instance, uh, and it has an SSM agent status of reporting in, right? So the next design decision, again, we have all of our necessary steps to this point to be able to do the triage collection on the EC2 instance, but I talked about this a little earlier. So if we have an EC2 instance that doesn't have access to you know, pull down our triage collection scripts um, or write to our evidence S3 bucket, what could we do? So this was an early design challenge that we had to account for. So in other words, how do I allow an EC2 instance without any AWS permissions uh, to write to or read from a private S3 bucket. Now, there's a couple ways that you know you could tackle this. Uh, you could use just-in-time provisioning, but that's a lot of overhead, right? I have to go and manually modify every single instance that I want to collect. Um, you could do that. Now, there's no problems with that generally, but if it was a production instance, right? Maybe people would be more hesitant to allow you to change their instance, um, specifically with S3 or whatever. Um, so we can talk through that. Um, the first kind of option that, that arose uh, was a pretty simple one. Uh, maybe not very secure, um, but the worst case isn't that bad. 
Um, and it does allow for a lot of flexibility where you could, you know, use this workflow on on-prem instances as well if they have the SSM agent installed in them. Because fun fact about SSM, you can install the agent on on-prem instances, and then you can have it report in the console. You can do this triage collection workflow as well. Um, so option one, we could allow for the triage script bucket. Again, that's the bucket where we're hosting our triage collection scripts. And then SSM is going to basically execute those scripts on the target instance to perform the collection. Um, we could allow this bucket to be publicly readable. So any identity could read from this bucket, right? So now an EC2 instance that I want to collect doesn't have the ability to read from any private S3 bucket. Who cares? It's a public bucket. So as long as it says internet access, you can read from this bucket. Second one, we could make the evidence bucket publicly writable. Same thing here. Um, you know, now it doesn't necessarily need to be able to write to a private S3 bucket. It could write to this public S3 bucket. Uh, again, we're not allowing public reads to this evidence bucket. We're just allowing public writes. And then we could, you know, if you're concerned, we can monitor file uploads to the um, evidence bucket to make sure no files get uploaded, you know, by mistake or maliciously. Um, and what is our worst case here? Well, our worst case is that a threat actor reads your triage collection scripts, right? Because it's publicly readable. Uh, and you could, if, if those triage collection scripts were intellectual property of your company, that could present challenges. And then maybe a threat actor could also write files to your evidence bucket. In the grand scheme of things, right, it's not too concerning. Maybe it leads to an increased cost. Uh, versioning would be enabled on this bucket, right? So even if they wrote a file with the same name, um, you would still have a, a copy of that file. But option one, right, not maybe the most secure, but a very flexible solution. Option two, I could create a programmatic IEM user, right, and get an access key and a secret access key. Um, and that programmatic IEM user would only have permissions to read from our specific triage script bucket. So we can't read from any bucket, only our triage script bucket to be able to pull down the triage collection scripts. And then it could also only write to the evidence S3 bucket, right? Not again, not every bucket, just the evidence bucket. And then I could, when I'm executing commands over SSM, I could hard code these access keys and these secret access keys into the commands that I'm doing, right? So that, you know, I gain access to these buckets and I can read and write from them. And I could even set up a, you know, an automatic build pipeline to periodically rotate these keys. Maybe it, you know, makes the keys inactive, it, disable, it disables them and deletes them. And then it spins up new keys for me uh, and, you know, replaces my triage collection script to have these keys or my, you know, my Lambda code to leverage these keys. Um, again, not, not a bad option. Uh, it allows for quite a bit of flexibility here. Um, but, you know, there is, you know, a more secure option. And I would argue that's option three. Now, with option three, this is really when the light bulb moment went off for us. Um, I'm fam I was familiar with pre-signed URLs, right, for like um, temporary access to download files. Um, but I didn't know that you can also use pre-signed URLs to upload files. So, Let's talk about what pre-signed URLs are in a second. I have a whole slide dedicated to what a pre-signed URL is and what it does and how to create it. Uh, but essentially, um, you know, the executive summary to pre-signed URLs is that they allow temporary access um, to you know, uh, write or read a specific file uh, from a private um, S3 bucket, right? So we'll, we'll get to this in a second. It may seem like a clear winner, but there are some strict design considerations that you need to account for. Uh, when creating these pre-signed URLs, when using these pre-signed URLs. I'll get to that in a second. Um, but as you, were, you can see, so here we are now, right? So we're going to move forward with the solution, and we've chosen option three to allow basically anonymous access to private S3 buckets. So we're going to generate pre-signed URLs at this stage. So as I talked about, uh, let's actually more you know, officially define what a pre-signed URL is. So it allows for a temporary read or a temporary write access to a file within an S3 bucket. So the read and write, so get or put methods, uh, whenever you create the pre-signed URL, you specify the method. Um, and you can either temporarily read a file or temporarily write a file to a bucket. Now, super important, you can read a single file or write a single file. It doesn't accept any wildcards at this point. I think I actually have a slide later because it's a very important point to mention. Um, but a pre-signed URL is generated by an AWS identity. In this case, I'd use my Lambda in the account that has, in the security account, that has access to both the um, evidence bucket and the triage collection bucket. So I'd use the um, identity that has the access to the target object, these buckets, um, and I would use that to generate the pre-signed URL. 
think of the pre-signed URL as a long token or string that, that provides that access, a long password, if you will. And then once I have that pre-signed URL, I'll give it to the identity um, that doesn't have access, right? The unauthorized user. In this case, I would give that pre-signed URL to our target EC2 instance. And it's basically going to authenticate to AWS using this pre-signed URL. Now, as I mentioned, when you create the pre-signed URL, we'll see this as an example code in a second. Um, when you create the pre-signed URL, you need to know the exact name of the target file that you want to read or write, right? That's one part of it. And you also need to specify the S3 bucket that you're gonna read or write from or to. So target name, S3 bucket, uh, method, which we specified above, is it a get request or is it a put request? And lastly, at the bottom, you need to set an expiry time. So a pre-signed URL remains valid for a limited amount of time. Again, it's temporary access. And this could be, you know, the time that you give it can be anywhere from seconds to when the uh, pre-signed URL is created. It can be good for X number of seconds, or it could be good to up to seven days. And here is some example code taken directly from uh, Bodo3. Uh, I want to call that out. I provided a link at the bottom there. This is not my own code, but I thought it was important to include here because you can see if you're decently familiar with Bodo3 and Python, um, you can read this function you know, pretty quickly. Um, they did a great job of writing this function. And I would almost argue there's more comments in here than there is code. Uh, so if I draw your attention to the line under the try block in the middle of the screen there, the response equals S3 client dot generate pre-signed URL. You can see this is where we're specifying kind of the objects that I talked about in the, in the uh, previous slide. So the first one is the method. So are you trying to generate a pre-signed URL to read an object? Is it a get object request? Or to write an object is gonna be a put object request. Not only that, but you need to specify the bucket and the uh, key name. So the entire key name, right? With the prefix and everything um, where you want to, where it exists within that bucket. And then you need the expiry time, right? So how long do you want this pre-signed URL uh, to be good for, right? Seconds to seven days. And if you did all that correctly, um, you'll get a response and the response will look something like this. So at first glance, the response may be kind of intimidating, but we'll talk about the anatomy of pre-signed URL. And hopefully by using some coloring, it'll uh, be a little more clear. So the items in green, again, are kind of the items that you specify when you create the pre-signed URL. And they're going to also be output in the pre-signed URL that's generated. So the first is the S3 bucket name, where the file lives that you want to read from or write to. Um, so if I want to you know, read a triage collection script, I'd give it the triage collection script in the bucket name. If I wanted to write an output evidence file, I'd also give it the S3 bucket where the evidence file will exist. And then same with the file to download the file name here. So this would be the name of your triage collection script, or it could be the name of the evidence package you want to upload. And lastly, at the bottom is the expiry time, right? So this is the epoch time, basically how long that this pre-signed URL is good for. Um, it'll compare against that. And if the time has already expired, even if everything else is right, this isn't going to work anymore. And provided you gave all that as input, um, parts of this are your output, right? So in blue now. So we get an access key ID. Um, we get a signature and we get an X Amazon security token. And again, all of these are used to authenticate the request. If you change any of this at all, and it's not exactly what Amazon is expecting, uh, you're going to get an unauthorized response, right? Now, in our specific um, triage collection workflow, I want to be very clear we're using pre-signed URLs for. So for each target instance, we're going to need two pre-signed URLs. And I touched on this briefly earlier. Um, but that's because when you create a pre-signed URL, you need to specify a method. Is it a get request or are we reading a file or is it a put request or are we writing a file? Can't do both. And they don't accept wildcards. I'll get to that in a second. But basically we need to generate two pre-signed URLs, one to allow us to read a Trialis collection script and another pre-signed uh, pre URL that we use to authenticate to write our output, our triage output evidence to an S3 evidence bucket. So for each target instance, again, we're gonna get two pre-signed URLs. So if we have 10 uh, EC2 instances that we're going to collect, we're going to generate 20 pre-signed URLs. Now, it's important to note, again, that pre-signed URLs, they need everything to be exact. One file name that you're going to read from, one file name you're going to upload to. They do not accept wildcards, right? So this is something we tried to make work whenever we first did it. I would love to just allow for a wildcard up upload, and then I can upload all of my different evidence pieces there instead of uh, having to zip them, right? So then I can do leverage Athena and, and query those raw files in S3. 
Um, now, with the zip files that we upload, again, we could only specify one file to read or one file to write. So that's why we need to zip it. Um, you need to specify the exact file names. If you don't, if there's a mismatch on any of that, it will not work. So you can see how pre-signed URLs are very rigid in that regard. Um, and that's mainly because AWS really, you know, uh, there are a few use cases where you should have your, uh, you know, anonymous users or entities uh, writing or reading to a private S3 bucket. This is one of them, I would argue, but AWS makes it a little more difficult. So after this point too, we're at the generate pre-signed URL um, phase. We just completed that. And we're gonna actually pipe those pre-signed URLs through to the send SSM command phase here. And this is gonna be responsible for performing our uh, triage collection workflow. And we're gonna pass those pre-signed uh, pre URLs, right? One for upload and one for a download uh, into the state. So let's get to kind of the meat and potatoes of this section here. So in this, you know, send command through SSM state, this is where we're going to be executing our commands. And there's a couple ways you can do this using SSM. Uh, SSM calls them documents, right? So you're going to be using some sort of document to execute commands on a target EC2 instance. And really, when we dove into this solution further, uh, you have two options here. Uh, the first is to leverage uh, one of these top two documents. So either the AWS run PowerShell script or the AWS run shell script. So PowerShell obviously will only work for Windows. And then the run shell script would work for Linux and Mac OS. Uh, now, this is where, you know, in your Bodo and your Python code, you would actually specify each specific command in line there uh, that you want to run against the target EC2 instance. Uh, this presents some challenges, I'd argue. Uh, and this is why I like the second option here. So AWS run remote script. Uh, this document can be run on any instance type. Now, granted, your remote script that you want to run needs logic to be able to execute on Windows, Linux, or Mac because the artifacts are different. Um, but what this document does, it executes scripts stored in a remote location on a target instance. So that remote location can be a public or private um, you know, GitHub repository or an S3 bucket. So in this case, uh, we're storing all of our triage collection scripts for Linux, Mac, and Windows. We're storing those in S3 bucket and we're using this AWS run remote script document to pull down those triage collection scripts and execute them live on an instance. Now, the reason why I like this, you know, second document here, AWS run remote script over, you know, one of the first two uh, run PowerShell script or run shell script is because, again, uh, the first ones there, the PowerShell script or the shell script, those are going to be defined in line in your Python code, right? So you basically pass in the commands you want to run. What I like about the second one is I can allow my defer professionals to update a script that's stored in S3, and they don't have to know much about Python or Bodo or Lambdas. They can have some minimal kind of cloud experience there, and they can focus on maybe some core aspects of instant response or defer, uh, and just update that remote script that's stored in that S3 bucket. So it allows for flexibility there. So once I've actually sent a series of commands through SSM, right, I tell um, SSM to execute this script on a target EC2 instance, I need to check the status of that SSM command. So when you run an SSM command, you're going to be returned with an SSM command ID. And that's a way to track each command that you've sent through SSM. And then you can query the status of that command ID. Now, when you first send a command, it may be you know, pending. It's waiting to send it. So it's waiting for the agent to accept the command and it'll run it on the system. When the agent starts to run the command on the system, uh, it'll go from pending to in progress, right? So the command is in progress. Your triage collection is happening. Uh, and then hopefully, eventually, it will uh, return a completed or a success status. So that's what this uh, basically output is doing. It's basically uh, describing that SSM command ID and checking the status associated with that command. And you know, if it gets a pending or an in progress, it's going to basically uh, leverage an exponential back off and a retry to keep querying that to see when it's successful. Now, if it's successful, it will move on to our next step in the step function here, tag evidence in S3. And if you get a, um, like a, a status code of like an error or a timeout, then it'll just break um, and it'll report a failure there, right? For some reason, target instance wasn't able to run your triage collection script. So it might be an issue um, with the script that you provided. But if everything checks out uh, and that SSM command actually returns a status of you know, complete success, uh, then you will get, for each instance, you'll get a output zip file um, in your S3 evidence bucket. 
And uh, again, that goes back to the fact that you get a zip file because with our pre-signed URLs that we're using to authenticate our reads and our writes, you can only read one file and write one file. So this is where we're writing one file uh, per instance to the evidence S3 bucket, right? So if I collect, if I wanna run our triage collection uh, script or sorry, workflow against 10 EC2 instances, I'll get 10 different zip files, each one leveraging a unique pre-signed URL to be able to write that uh, to S3. And with this state, what's really uh, interesting is from our first, uh, if you remember our first state in the step function in the map state to describe target instance, where we got a lot of valuable metadata. Well, now we're tagging all of our output zip files with that metadata. So if someone wasn't familiar with the collection, they could quickly look at that output object uh, in the evidence S3 bucket, and they would see a bunch of different metadata flags, maybe one around case ID, maybe one around original instance, account region where this you know, uh, instance lived. Uh, so that output file would be tagged with a lot of appropriate um, metadata, and you can tailor that to your reporting needs. And here's some example output, right? So again, this would really depend on your triage uh, scripts that you're running against the instance, what you return, uh, but these are highly customizable. So any of your playbooks, you probably have some good collection scripts out there that uh, you know work for you that you could easily pipe over to this process. Uh, the top one would be an example, like a Linux or Mac instance, uh, and, and the bottom one would be an example of some output you could get from a Windows instance as part of this triage collection workflow. Now, again, uh, you're gonna get an output zip file. So for the sake of showing you more than just output.zip, I've actually gone ahead and unzipped them so you could see the different files there. And as you can see, what started to be, you know, when we first started, this may look like a complex step function, but when we go step by step, you can quickly understand each step here. So we've tackled every step within the step function, beginning to end. So some pro tips now, if you made it this far, uh, thank you for sticking with me. I wanted to reward you with some pro tips, um, you know, if you were to go ahead and try to implement aspects of the solution in your own workflow. So the first one is around deployment and testing consideration. So first, you know, always try to make your solution as highly available as you can. Maybe your MVP doesn't have to be, uh, you know, as highly available as a production uh, solution. Um, but with that, I will say when you first start testing, maybe deploy in a single region. And then when you start to shift the solution and depend more on the solution, maybe shift towards a multi-region deployment, right? And that has to do with, let's say AWS had an outage in USD SWAN for systems manager for SSM. If I'd only deployed the solution in USD SWAN, well, I can't use systems manager anymore. I can't use a solution. Uh, so maybe also consider deploying this solution in a secondary region like US uh, West SWAN or something. So if USD SWAN goes down, you can quickly pivot and use a solution in US West SWAN. And then I can't stress testing enough. You don't test enough. You may break things. People will get angry with you, right? This is all about acceptance. You want the solution to be well received by your organization. So roll out the solution in phases and test extensively. Start with a single test account, right? Where you can use the same account and maybe a cross region workflow. And then slowly move on to onboard additional test accounts, right? Test accounts at this point. Uh, so that way you're able to practice your cross account collections. And then when you begin uh, to get comfortable with this, right, you have all of your workflow worked out, then start to, you know, begin to productionize the solution. So maybe start to onboard additional you know, low priority production accounts. Uh, and then once you get super mature, you can start to leverage the uh, Amazon event bridge, like I had mentioned in the earlier document, um, to uh, leverage native integrations and custom integrations to trigger this workflow. So you can become that much more automated uh, of a solution. Um, so that was with deployment and testing considerations with security considerations. I need to stress this as well. So as you know, Systems Manager I've shown is a powerful tool, right? It allows you to execute commands in a, in a very high integrity context on target EC2 instances. Um, and that's great for our use case that we need, but it can easily bis, uh, be misused and it can end up doing more harm than good. Let's say a threat actor were to get access to Systems Manager to run commands, they could spread very quickly, right? So you can see how much harm that could do. So with that, consider locking down what users or roles have permissions to use SSM, to update SSM documents, to run commands. And you can do this in a few different ways. Uh, if your accounts are part of an organization, you can use uh, what's called a service control policy, an SCP. Uh, if they're not, you can still use permission boundaries in each account. So even if my user tried to give itself access to um, you know, do something with systems manager, if I have a permission boundary set up that doesn't allow, uh, SSM, then they wouldn't allow, be allowed to do that. So think about that. And then I'd also be very proactive about everything. So if you're concerned about using SSM, 
Well, create custom detections and alerting uh, through CloudTrail. You know, when a user or role tries to use SSM, um, you know, you can quickly detect on that. You can alert on that. Even if it's successful, maybe you want to know the successful times when SSM is used too, just for all of your reporting. Uh, so if you can really implement these bottom two bullets here, I think you're, you're in a good place when it comes to security. And lastly, for my super technical folks on the call, I have some additional considerations here too. So some more pro tips. Uh, I, I talked about a map state very briefly. Look into this in step functions. Uh, basically, it allows for parallel execution without slowing down one arm of uh, input. So look into that. Second point here, so AWS recently came out with ARM Lambda types. Uh, traditionally, you'd have to use an x86 Lambda type. Now, if ARM Lambda types fit your use case, definitely give them a try, right? I've used them in a lot of my workflows because AWS quotes about 20% better performance at a 20% reduced cost. So why would I not want to perform 20% better and use 20% you know, less money? Uh, that's, that's awesome there. Uh, so definitely look into ARM Lambda types over traditional x86 Lambda types um, you know, if it fits your use case. The third point here, I talked about this. We use these in our check states, but leverage exponential backoffs and retries uh, to hopefully fix certain errors right within your step function. Pretty self-explanatory. Um, so a, a pro about um, triage collection um, that's a con with full disk collection. I'll get to this in a second. Um, but with the second to last bullet here, so um, traditional EBS snapshots that I've used to perform a, a full disk collection, uh, they do not capture instance store data. So this could be a use case for a triage collection. If you have a lot of instance store data present on your EC2 instance that's lost upon termination of an EC2 instance, um, you could collect that instance store data through this triage collection um, solution by updating your triage collection scripts to look for instance store data and output it to S3. So if you needed that as well. And lastly, you know, test, 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 and definitely train um, you know, different professionals on how to use this solution. Um, you know, what's input, what's output. I've seen a lot of um, you know, potential clients who uh, spend a lot of really good time and money and they're doing all the right things too, uh, but just make sure that your staff is also trained up on how to use those solutions. Just if a solution exists in an account and you don't know how to use it, it's not doing much good. So some limitations, I've touched on a few of these already, um, but essentially uh, as stated earlier with the prereqs, right? It may not be realistic for an organization or a company to have 100% coverage of EC2 instances with the SSM agent pre-installed. Right, and we get that. Um, now, this is where the full disk collection solution, if you're able to design something like that as well, would really support this limitation because the full disk collection solution doesn't uh, rely on any agent to be present on your target EC2 instance to do a full disk collection, right? We're doing it through API calls at the AWS account level. So it's really helpful to pair this triage collection solution with the full disk collection solution to ensure you know, uh, as much coverage as you can. And with that, I did want to leave you with some resources on further learning. Um, so this first bullet and the third bullet, I'm very biased because those are actually talks that I have given. Uh, so the first one is this Q3 uh, tech talk that I discussed during my introduction. Uh, that's the Q3 tech talk I gave uh, partnered with AWS to deliver. And that's going to cover um, full disk collections and memory collections of EC2 instances in AWS, how we automated that workflow. Um, there is a link to the talk as well as to the, the presentation slides I used. Um, so please give those a look if you're looking to implement anything related to full disk collections or memory collections of these two instances. Uh, let me skip over the second one for now. The third one is the uh, talk that I gave at reInvent last year, uh, so SEC 306. And this is at the account level, right? So uh, this talk will show you basically how to enable full disk collections and um, triage collections uh, through automation, but it's gonna show you how to create custom cloud trail detections, uh, how to enrich CloudTrail data, right? If you give me an IP address, maybe we enrich it with geo uh, location, um, for example, and then how to auto remediate some findings there too, or how to trigger, you know, automated collection workflows, such as the triage uh, collection workflow or the full disk collection workflow. So that is SEC, SEC 306. Uh, that's the reInvent talk. Again, the slides and the talk are there as well. Uh, I think I had a, a quarantine uh, mustache on that one, so please don't judge me. Uh, the second one, this is a really good talk that a lot of my coworkers gave um, at KPMG. Uh, they partnered with Toyota to deliver this talk. Um, so Toyota is doing a lot of really interesting work. Once they get the um, evidence back from a collection, either triage collection or full disk collection, they're starting to automate some of the pre-processing, the processing of evidence, and some of the analysis, right? So they're running a lot of 
uh, valuable tools against that evidence that they pull back such that the incident responder doesn't have to rely on, you know, running the tools themselves. They can do the important, you know, analysis uh, part of the investigation. So again, the talk and the slides are there as well. Um, so with that, again, I wanted to close and say thank you for all of you uh, for attending not only besides VFW, but also my talk. Uh, I'm very uh, lucky to have you guys as uh, attendees here. And thank you again to all the organizers of the besides DFW conference. Um, there's a few ways you can get in touch with me after the fact if you have any questions. Uh, first, probably my preference is LinkedIn. I check LinkedIn all the time, pretty active on LinkedIn. I'll post the slides there as well. And then the link for this talk when it gets published eventually, uh, that'll be on LinkedIn. Um, you can expect a pretty quick response there too. Uh, I've provided my personal email address. I'm not allowed to share my uh, KPMG uh, email address with just anybody. Uh, so my personal email address is there as well. And then Twitter and Discord. So I'll be you know, attending the talks for the rest of the day today. Uh, I'll be around on Discord, um, but yeah. So if there's anything you think of as you start to digest a lot of this information, uh, you wanna share maybe your experiences in automating triage or full disk collections, or you just have questions in general, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, but with that, thank you again, and I'll open it up now to any questions that you may have.